Cool. So um, yesterday we made a start uh, looking at assembly, um, and then we looked at assembly of molecules. Uh, today uh, I would like to uh, take it one step further, and we're going to look at assembly of particles, and we're going to look at directed assembly. So we're not going to look at self-assembly. We're going to look at how particles, um, under the influence of interfaces or under the influence of um, templating, can arrange themselves into uh, larger structures. And that is one of the uh, activities here at work. Um, so my group does a lot of this. So the pictures at the top uh, are a few of the examples uh, of the work that we've done recently. And uh, we're going to highlight some of these things. So what we typically do, um, if, you, if you do that, you always have to thank a lot of people. So I don't, I, I don't do that work, mostly. So it's, uh, I've got a, a bunch of PhD students, 12 of them who work really hard, and there's some former people as well. And then you collaborate with lots of people all over the world, because obviously if there, you know, if there's someone somewhere else who's better at something than you, then why in reinvent the wheel? The best thing is to do is just to collaborate. So, um, so hopefully um, this will be interesting. So, so what um, is the area of supracolloidal chemistry in a way? So the main question is, is, can we assemble colloidal particles into larger structures? So it's quite similar. The word is conveniently stolen from the supramolecular chemist. So you just you know, get rid of the word molecular and replace it with colloidal. And uh, so what do we do here um, at Warwick is that we, you know, we make complex particles. And with complexity, I mean, uh, you can add a certain function to it. So for example, they could they could dock a certain molecule, or they can have a certain metability, or they can have a certain shape. And then it's always quite important to keep in mind that if you develop something, it has to be scalable. Because if you make you know, two of these particles and you want to apply it in a material, you don't need two, you need a couple of million at least. So it's important to keep that in mind if you do this. So and then uh, you know, we made a start already uh, on how these particles behave in liquids. And we're going we're gonna to extend that a little bit. So you have to know a little bit of physics and a little bit of math in order to, to understand this. And then we already talked in the, in the module on how particles interact with themselves quite briefly and how they potentially then also interact with foreign objects. And if you understand those two things, then you, know, you might have a go at turning it into a functional uh, macroscopic material. So what are we going to do today? Well, um, I think what's really important is, is just to have a few examples so that you can see uh, what we mean with that. So I've, I've, I want to focus on, on a phenomenon which is called Pickering stabilization. And uh, we'll go through the basics of this. And we're going to deviate from the basics a bit. And we talked about uh, emulsion and mini emulsion polymerizations before. So I'm going to uh, highlight things that we can do if we do this with particles rather than with surfactant molecules. And if, if there's time left, uh, we're going to look at how we can template materials. So let's start with the first bit, pickering stabilization. It's used in industry a lot. In the food industry, it's very common. In cosmetics, it's quite common. And it, it's a very old phenomenon. Well, very old. It's quite an old phenomenon. And recently, there's a massive search uh, in papers, so I would say in the last five to 10 years, there's a bit of an explosion uh, that people are interested in this, uh, in this particular phenomenon again. So the question is, what is it? Now, this is, this is basically it. Is that colloidal matter or particles, solid particles, can stick to a soft interface. Now, obviously, you have to define what is a soft interface. And a soft interface is anything that can, in a way, can deform. So the easiest thing that you can imagine, it could, for example, be a, a liquid air interface, yeah, a liquid gas interface, or it could be a liquid liquid interface, or you know, it, it potentially just could be a, a polymer blend, a polymer interface in the melt state. So then you also have like a liquid liquid state. So anything that can deform a little bit, it doesn't really. Well, you could also argue maybe that you know we, we saw before that we absorb things on a on a membrane via columbic interactions on those vesicles. 
but that deviates a bit from, from the underlying physics of this. So let's stick to, to liquid liquid um, at the moment. So the interesting thing here is that Pickering stabilization, the first guy that, well, at least that I could find, um, was not Pickering. It was a person called Ramsden who described it in 1903. And then, uh, and then people didn't really realize that he wrote anything about this phenomenon. So Pickering, a few years later in 1907, uh, did a lot on, on these type of emulsions. So basically what he, what he found was that if you had hydrophobic, relatively hydrophobic microscopic matter, that if you would have an oil and water mixture, and if you would shake that, that the oil droplets that you would, in this case, generate, that they would be stable, and they would not coalesce if they would bump into each other. So it doesn't mean with stability that, you know, gravity suddenly doesn't matter anymore, because if you have a large oil droplet, the density difference still counts. Yeah, so if the oil would be lighter than water, all these droplets would still go up. But when they touch each other, they don't fuse. So that's what they mean with, you know, pickering stability. So, and then a bunch of years later, in 1928, um, the effect was kind of qualitatively described by Hildebrandt and Finkel and, and Draper in, in JAX. And then it took a very long time before people started doing stuff with this. So I just wanted to show you a little bit uh, of, a, of an example. So here you see a water droplet on a glass slide. This is quite interesting because normally glass is hydrophilic, a water droplet is hydrophilic. So normally you would say that the water would just wet the glass and you would not get a contact angle. So that's basically the angle, the three phase angle between, you know, the, the bottom substrate and the air and the uh, and the droplet. So in this case, it looks like a, you know, it looks like a pretty pretty big angle. Um, that that would not happen. But however, you have to remember that this this droplet is covered in hydrophobic microscopic particles that you in this image you can't see because this is just taken with an ordinary camera. And um, so this droplet is a, a few millimeters in size. And it looks a little bit like a marble in a way, but it's not a sphere. It's an egg. So why is it an egg? Why wouldn't it be a perfect sphere? Yeah, gravity. So gravity, gravity is, is important. And actually, if you, let's hold also for a normal water droplet, right? So if you, if you look, a small water droplet on any surface would be like a spherical type of cap. Depending on the angle, it could vary a bit. But you, you don't get this distortion. And that's the difference between gravitational force and, and interfacial tension. So if interfacial tension dominates this droplet, if it would be smaller, would be a sphere. If gravity starts to play a role, it distorts it and it becomes more than an X, which kind of makes sense, right? So, so and, and the difference between the two, if you would scale those two, you're talking about capillary length. So if, if, if people talk about individual droplets lying on a, on a surface and they want to measure contact angles, you've got to make sure that you're below the gravity regime because otherwise you distort the thing at the top. So, so what's going to happen? Now, I have this droplet, and now I'm going to just let it sit, and the water is going to evaporate. So what is going to happen with the droplet? What is the opinion? So water will evaporate. What happens to the droplet? Shrinks. shrinks. Okay. Why would it shrink? Evaporates. Yeah, okay. The water, yeah, this is logical. But how will it shrink? So what will happen to the shape of it if it shrinks? Become more spherical. It's, it's one opinion. Everybody agrees? People going, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, everybody's wrong. So, so I'll show you what will happen. So it just implodes. 